Let's go before the Lord immediately. Father, we thank you, Father. We praise you. We give you all the glory and all the honor. For you are the King, you are the Lord, you are the Savior. I stand in repentance, Father. In the name of Jesus, forgive me of all my sins, for I am a sinner. I pray, Lord God, that you would anoint these lips of flesh and blood to speak your will, your word, not man's opinions or ideas, but your word, Lord God. Let us not be distracted to the right or to the left, Father, but be attentive to what you have for us this day. And in all things, we're going to give you the praise and all the glory. In the blessed holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Let's give the Lord praise one more time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's important for us to know that I am not here to entertain no one today. We're not here to entertain anyone in any form. I'm not here to make buddies with anyone today. I'm here to be deliberate in what God has called me to speak. I'm very careful in what the Lord asks me to speak. And today he has given me a message in the preparation of the body. The first scripture context I want to give you is in Acts chapter 2, very familiar passage, verse number 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. When we look at the history of revival that has taken place in our world in reality, when we look at the move of God, we see some miraculous moves in the acts of God and what God has done in the lives of people. This last week, I was looking at some actual uh, interviews that were taken in the late 70s of an elderly couple that were in the Azusa Street Revival in 1906. And the elderly couple were in their 80s and their 90s. And they were interviewing them. And I put a few things down. I want to quote what they actually said. And these were two witnesses that were actually at the place where God began to move mightily. They said the main thing is when they walked into the place... It says that even actually before they walked into the place, you can feel the presence of God when you, when, you, when you pass by on the outside. It says that, and I'll quote, it says, the presence of God was so powerful that it took their breath away, that the spirit within would be as if it was leaping on the inside, unquote. And I believe that the reason why that was happening was because now they were in the presence of God in which we were created to be from the beginning, and let me tell you, if the flesh is uncomfortable with the Word of God, if you're hearing something that's making this flesh uncomfortable, then praise the Lord and it's working. The flesh doesn't like the things of God. The flesh kicks and bucks. But let me tell you, the Spirit desires to be in God's presence. It says when the evidence, the actual words, once again, of the witnesses, it says this. It says, people began, I'll quote, people began to come from the streets. And it says, they said, from gambling houses and harlot houses. And it says they didn't know anything about church work, unquote. It says the Spirit of the living God began to draw people in from everywhere when God began to move. When the presence of God was evident, people began to come from everywhere. And I believe the reason that happens is because they got people from, from times past. It could have been two generations past where somebody was praying and said, bless my bloodline in the days to come. Bless my family and my children. So when the Spirit of God begins to move, it draws them in and they can't shake it. They can't let go of this thing. It says that some of the folks that he didn't even gone to church that during that time, it says in our quote, it says, they would speak at the job sites and places of work and the marketplaces. They would say in our quote, Los Angeles is being visited by a mighty rushing wind. Unquote. Being visited by a mighty rushing wind. So it's very important you stay with me. I'm going to shift for now for the next few moments. I believe that as people of God... Everything we do on a, on a daily basis is either going to enhance the kingdom of God or it's going to hinder it. You're either going to help it or you're going to hinder it. And every situation we have to deal with, whether it's personal or in public, 
will either allow us to help us to grow in the things of God or it will pull us away from God's presence. Mark, 20, Mark chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says this. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I tell the men, and they will, they, will, they will verify that. I tell them almost every Tuesday, bring the lost. I tell them like this, bring in the Torah folk. Bring those that are sick physically and spiritually that God will manifest his power in the lives of others. A healthy church to me is not based on its size. A healthy church is not based to me on how much money they have. A healthy to me, church to me is not based on how big their campus is. A healthy church to me is, are they reaching the lost? Are they soul winners? Are they being deliberately and bold with the word of God? Once again, is that church, I thank the Lord for my pastor and his wife and his family. People that believe in evangelism and reaching the lost. That no matter who they are, bring them in. It's not based on how many breakfasts we have. But are they soul winners? And once again, I thank the Lord for our staff and our pastor for who they are in Christ and the heart that they have in reaching people that are, that are down and out. So if the body of Christ, if the church is bringing in the lost, the spiritually sick, they will come into the church. Listen, church, preparation time. They are going to come in with their problems and their issues, their addictions, and their attitudes, their personalities, and their anger. They will bring with them their unforgiveness, their hurts, and their pain. The body of Christ are so many individuals amongst us that go out in public and offer life and hope and healing to everyone we encounter. Stay with me. John 8, 4 through 11. Here we have the story of the woman caught in adultery, and they bring her right to Jesus. Stay with me. Verse number 4. They said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Remember, hidden sin will be revealed. Hidden sin will be brought to the light. It will be exposed publicly if we do not stand in repentance. Here they call him master when they brought her. They call him master in hopes of flattering him to maybe have ensnared him when just the days before they were calling him a deceiver. Verse number five, they said, Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? They wanted to trick Jesus, but the fact still remains in reality that, that she was caught in the act. There was no denying that. She was caught in the act. Her hands and her feet were all the way up in that cookie jar. She was caught in the act. So they use the same laws of God to condone their actions. Many folks in reality say that they are Christians and they try to enforce, uh, uh, they try to enforce laws on others that they themselves don't keep. In other words, do as I say, not as I do. They want to hang folks in reality instead of helping them stand in position of repentance and to learn to, and to grow from it. Verse number six says this. This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as, they, he, as though he heard them not. So just paint the picture in your mind for a moment of Jesus stepping to the ground kneeling down and writing something on the ground. I think, I mean, I, I, I kind of believe that maybe in heaven that might not be important at all. 
But with this limited mind here on earth, I say, man, when I get to heaven, I want to ask Jesus, what were you writing on the ground? What were you, what, 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 what were you doodling on the ground? So paint the picture. Everyone surrounding her and Jesus, but they weren't just surrounding her and Jesus standing there. They all had huge rocks in their hands. They all had huge rocks in, her, in their hands. So imagine what she felt like based on what the law said and what they have done to others. And now she's standing before them, but yet with the master. But he's standing there as if he's ignoring them. Let's go to verse number seven. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman, the woman standing in the midst. Hmm. They were there as a mob, as a group to come together to stone her, to kill her for the act she was caught in. They were there as a group. But when the conviction of the master came upon them, it was now personal. They began to look at themselves and realize their sin and the conviction came upon them. And they began to leave, not as a mob, but as an individual, one at a time. They began to separate themselves from God's presence. Let me tell you, buddy. That's why it is so hard many times for the world to come to church because a church will stand around, hanging around in the front and the outside with rocks in their hands. The church has a different, the people have a difficult time coming to church. The laws, the sick, those who are infirm have a difficult time coming to the presence of God because the church has been judgmental for so long. And they see the, the religious folks standing around with rocks and they choose not to come. Let me tell you, when I encounter people, no matter what they've done in life, I don't care if she's a woman of the night or a man of the night. I don't care if they're dope fiends or gangbangers or who they are or pimps or they think they're prophets. I don't care who they are. I don't discuss their issue. I don't discuss how much money they make, how long they've been gangbanging. My, my position is to present Jesus. I don't care what you've done. The Lord doesn't care where you've been or what you've done. But where do you stand in him now? If the Lord didn't care, who are we? To be judgmental. The church at one time was seen as a spiritual hospital to help all the sick. But spiritually speaking and giving that example, sometimes you go to even to a hospital here, you go to community somewhere else, you got to wait 15 hours in emergency. And that's how it was many times in churches. They were seen as hospitals, but they had a long spiritual wait to get the help. Then there are those hospitals that became urgent cares to minister to people immediately. But they were very limited in what they, what they can do, just like a regular urgent care, very limited in what they can do. Stay with me now. I'm going to go to verse number 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The church in reality today needs to be a, a spiritual trauma unit. That it does not matter. See, in the trauma unit, I don't care if you get a shotgun blast to the chest, they'll take you. You can get an accident, they'll take you. Whatever it is in a trauma unit, those specialists there will take you. That's what the church needs to be today, a spiritual trauma unit. That no matter the condition of the person spiritually, come and watch what the, what the God of the King of kings and the Lord of lords will do. Regardless of the circumstance, it does not matter if your marriage is failing, God will heal it. It doesn't matter what sickness and disease, God will heal it. If we'll stand, watch what the Lord will do. We need to be, the church need to be the, the front liners in the front line going out now. 
that the power of God will begin to move. When the revival began to take place in our, in our history books, when it talked about it, the first thing that took place, of course, because of prayer and fasting and seeking God, was the presence of God, like our pastor said this morning in prayer. The presence of God was evident in that place. Then the next thing that happened as I was reading the documentation and, and not studying them, but just reading some of the examples of all the different revivals that took place, it says that the Spirit of the living God began to bring the people in. Began to bring the people in from everywhere. And I, as I was reading that, the Lord began to put it upon my spirit and began to tell me to tell them. To tell them. Let them know what I'm about to do. You see, because for so many years, the religious folks have come to church for themselves. The religious folks had come for selfish reasons for me and myself and what I'm going through and what I need. And because of that, they have stood for so many years in a posture of complacency. And the Lord said, it is time to pour out. Pour out that which he has placed within you and those whom you are about to encounter. So this Friday, I want to tell you, this Friday, it was about 3.25, 3.24 a.m. in the morning, I was in prayer. And as I was praying, the Lord began to show me something. And you've never heard me come to you about any vision God has given me because I haven't had any. And I'm not going to say something the Lord does not place upon me. So at 3.25, 3.24, I noted it down. The Lord began to show me something. He says, I'm about to pour my spirit upon people. He says, and I'm going to send them, and I'm going to bring them in. And the Lord began to show me. He began to show me vessels. I didn't see the vessels that were in the midair. I didn't see them as humans. I seen them as vessels that were designed to, to hold the spirit of the living God. And the vessels were moving about. And as the vessels were moving about, they began to pour out upon people. They began to pour out upon places and everything that they would pour on to, every person they would pour on to, it says the dead, he says, those things that were dead were coming to life. It says those things that were wrong were made right. Those vessels began to pour out everywhere. Then as the vessels were moving, I seen the vessels turn for a moment and I seen faces on the vessels. The Lord shows, he said, it's my people, it's my body. He said, I'm about to pour into my people. Then as the people, the vessels were pouring out, I began to see that they were stopping and just pouring this way. But simultaneously, they began to move as if they were scattering the spirit. They began to move as if they were no longer pouring, but they were scattering. And it was landing everywhere. And everything that it touched began to get up in life. It began to heal. And the Lord says, ask them, ask my vessels, are they willing? He said, ask them if they are willing. He says, and not get mad, not get upset when the spiritually sick walk in this place. He says, that's going to cause their flesh to not like what they're seeing. Those that have been complacent and indifferent are not going to feel good about it because the flesh is not going to like it. He says, but that's going to be my move. Are you going to get mad and uncomfortable because when the sick spiritually walk in this place and they take your seat that you've been sitting on for so many years? Are you going to get mad and uncomfortable because there's no more room in you here? And then pastor's got to get up and say, you people of God need to go wait outside. Yes. Or are you going to get mad and become indifferent and not like it because you're going to be uncomfortable? God said, I'm about to move. He said, I need my vessels to pour. You see, many times the, the religious folk, they expect the pastor to do all the pouring it's not going to happen without you. You're the Lord who told me. You're the one that's going to pour. 
When they began to come into this place, you're going to begin to pour outside. The parking attendants are going to begin to pour and scatter outside by the cars. They're going to park and they're going to begin to move. He says, ask them, are they willing? Are you capable to pour to others that don't look like you? Are you capable of pouring out to those that don't smell like you? Are you willing to pour out to others that don't talk like you? Are you willing to scatter amongst those that don't live like you? The Lord said, ask them, are they willing? Christ, by this teaching, is identifying the difficult cases that would be proposed to us. In other words, he's saying, don't be so quick to shoot your mouth. Think twice before you speak once. Proverbs 15, 28 says this. The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. The Lord began to show me and said, I begin to pour. The flesh is going to be very, very uncomfortable. It's going to mess up your worship. It's going to mess up the way we do things every Sunday. When my spirit begins to move, the spirit will cause others to get out of the way. The spirit is going to do what it has to do, what it's going to do regardless. What if we were willing? What if we were willing that the Lord would fill us you see, because the last image that I received as they were scattering, it's as if when they were scattering, the blessings and the power that was within those vessels that they were scattering, the vessels were being emptied. And as they were, being, as they were scattering, they were being poured into. As they were scattering, they were being poured into. But they did not get filled Again, while they were pouring, it's as if only when they began to scatter and to pour out everything that God has already placed within them, God says, I'm filling you once again. When the Lord showed me that, I began to just glorify and praise him. And I said, Lord, I don't want to be on the sidelines. I want to be a vessel to be used by you, Lord God. But I'm going to tell you something, church. It will cost you. There's a word that the church refuses to use nowadays, and it's a word holiness. The church refuses to use the word holiness because it's a difficult task. It will cost you. You'll have to pray. You have to push back the plate. You're going to start saying yes to some things and no to a whole bunch of stuff. The church is... The church is staying away from that word holiness. And God says, I desire to bless my people. He says, if you are willing. If you are willing, I will fill you that you will scatter. That you will pour out upon all that is dead and I will give it life. He says, those children and grandchildren that have been running from God, he says, I'll come to them in their sleep. He says, I'll come to them in their sleep that when they wake in the morning for a moment, they will not understand what's actually happening and the spirit will begin to give clarity and they will begin to search me out. Yeah. 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 Get them all you see, when the Lord places us before an individual or when the individual is placed before us, when we begin to pour out to that person or that group or that family, the domino effect around that family, that individual is tremendous. 
The greatest testimony I hear about the man is when the wife comes and talks to me. Some of the greatest testimony I hear of the man is when the, the children, the teenagers come and talk to me about their dad, of what God is doing in their life. The effects. The effects of the move of God are mighty if we are willing. The Lord says, tell them I need, to, I need for them to stand in repentance. I need them to stand in repentance. Put up my shit in me. Or is it that you're willing to converse with them and be willing to help them all accept that one because of what that individual did to me or to my child? You have no right to dictate the move of God on somebody else's life. Either you're going to be used by God or you're not. You, you and I cannot choose. I've said it before, we're not given a pass based on our environment. We're not given a pass based on how we feel. We're not being given a pass because of sickness and disease. Sickness and disease, your infirmities do not dictate what God has called you to do. You might be in the hospital and sick, and God says, you better talk to that doctor. You better talk to that nurse. We think that because our environment is difficult, we're given a pass not to do what God has called us to do. Nowhere in Scripture do you see that pass. There's no get out of jail pass. Some of the most difficult people to minister to are those that cause your painful memories to surface. And we still have to be obedient to what God has called us to do. Ask my people, are they willing? Are you secure in your relationship and who you are in Christ? Or will your emotions take over? Will your senses take over? Are you in a position to be available, to be available to God, that once again, when he has the people cross our paths, that we can minister to them? So look, don't miss this. Going back to John chapter 8, verse number 4. That this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. They brought her to Jesus exactly the way she was. Look, they did not bring her to Jesus in the temple. They did not bring her to Jesus in the synagogue. Jesus is out in the streets ministering to those that were in need. Within the body, the Lord is raising individuals right now. He is raising individuals that I see in the Lord show me as spiritual trauma units. They're not waiting in reality for the advancement of people to come in. They're going out to the streets and finding them. They're going to their co-workers. They're going into their own household, their neighbors, and they're bringing their, their, their portable trauma units that are powerful. The spiritual shotgun blast, they can minister to them. No matter what the situation is, they're doing something in the kingdom of God. The Lord says, tell them, are they willing? Within the body, are they willing that God will move? We need to be in a position as a body, one body, to be used by God regardless, once again, of who he places before us. Or are we limited in who we can minister to because of who they are because of them or that group. In reality and in closing, spiritually speaking, the people of God should never be out in public or at the front doors of the church holding rocks and being judgmental because the Lord should make it very clear to them. My move is already happening, but I'm about to bring them in. And it's going to be you. You see, you're going to have to be in a position that when new guests walk in here, people that don't know Christ, you're going to have to get out of that position of complacency and look around and say, the Lord is going, he's telling me to go talk to them right now. To go shake their hand, to go encourage them and just love on them. 
See, we want to come into the house of God and right away sit down and then tell God what you got for me. What do you have for me? The Lord says, I've been pouring into you all these years. It's time that you now pour out to everyone else. It's time that you move supernaturally. That in turn, I'll fill you once again. See, we're okay with God's blessing that happened to us 10 years ago. Praise the Lord. 10 years ago, standing on the same blessing we received from God because we got blessed 10 years ago. God said, don't you see I'm doing a brand new thing? I'm about to pour my spirit. Are my people ready? Be ready and be prepared to be used by God as vessels. That in turn, he will continue to fill you. You see, if you do not pour what God has already placed within you, you ain't receiving nothing new. We're not receiving anything new. But I guarantee you, you begin to pour and watch the fresh anointing, the fresh wind, the fresh power and the discernment of God that will come upon you that it wasn't even like the one you had 10 years ago. It wasn't like the one you received last week or yesterday or this morning, but a fresh unction of your spirit and his power. You see, we think that God can do something through us because of what we've done. I guarantee you, you're not going to find anybody perfect in this place today. Not a single person. I'll tell you right now, if you find that perfect man, if you find that perfect vessel, you better get on your knees and worship that person because you just met Jesus. That's what you've just done. You better get on your knees and worship him because that's the person that's perfect. I am not perfect. You're not perfect. And God will use you in a mighty way if you stand in repentance and allow him to bless you. The devil is working overtime right now. And the people are open. The people of God are okay. The religious folk are okay. Standing in complacency. The Lord says, I'm about to move. He says, but I need vessels. There are so many of you in here today that the Lord has called you to this body. I'm not saying to this church. I'm saying to this body. He has called you to this body. And some of you have come kicking and bucking. Some of you do not know why. God says, I'm gathering my people because I'm about to fill these vessels up. I have called you to this body for a reason. Okay, the Holy Ghost just told me, I need everybody to stand right now. Let there be order in the house of God. Let there be reverence. Let there be order and reverence in the house of God. The Lord says, age does not dictate the move of my spirit. He says, when I pour, I'm going to bless the children. He goes, children will begin to bring the presence of God into the house. He says, I'm about to have children speak supernaturally. He says, the teenagers are, beginning, are going to begin to speak mightily. The teenagers are going to begin to prophesy. The pe- teenagers are going to begin to lay hands on the sick. He says, couples that the enemy tried to destroy their marriage, he says, I'm about to heal that marriage that they in turn are now going to be used to heal others. He says, those that are seniors, he goes, those that have been with me for many years, he goes, I'm about to pour a spirit upon them. Age will not be a factor. He goes, I will anoint their lips. I will anoint their words. They will be deliberate. He says, those that are seniors are going to begin to speak and to prophesy. He goes, I will begin to use them mightily. You're going to begin to see the hand of God move in a supernatural way if the people are willing. The Lord says, do not ask them twice. Do not ask them three times. He says, but let them identify themselves if they are vessels or not. If you're a vessel to be filled of God and you want to be used by God supernatural days to come, he says, only ask them once. I'll ask you only one time. Come to the front right now. He said, ask them only once because they will identify. Quickly, let there be order in the house of God. And if you don't think that you can be used of God, the devil is a liar. Quickly, make room. There's more coming. Make room. Squeeze in. Come on, squeeze in. Squeeze to the front. Squeeze to the center. Come on, I need everybody out front. Come on, squeeze in, squeeze in. Don't look at me, begin to worship God, but listen. Raise your hands and begin to glorify the Father. 
You're a vessel. You're being identified as a vessel. Let me talk to you. Keep praying, but keep. But let me talk to you, sisters, for a minute. Some of you sisters are going to have to step aside for a moment because God's about to do something amongst your men. God's about to do something amongst the men that have surrounded you. And you're going to have to step aside just for a moment that God will begin to work through him in a mighty way. And when God begins to move, that you will nurture what God is placing amongst that man, amongst those men in your life. Do not take it for granted if there's still children, the boys are, are males and they're teenagers. God, I'm about to raise them. They're going to begin to speak. And with that, you're going to begin to see that covering flow back to you. That the woman, that the woman will begin to be used in a mighty, mighty, powerful, supernatural way in the things of God. You're identified as vessels. Begin to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Lord, right now, Heavenly Father, these vessels are before you, Lord God. I pray, Father, for a fresh function of your spirit upon these vessels, Lord God, that in turn, they're going to begin to pour, Lord God, regardless of why they have come to this body. They might have thought they were coming to this body because of something that was going on in their marriage or something that was going on where they were at. But Lord, you have brought them as vessels for a reason. Let them stand, Father, as vessels to know how to pour, how to scatter, Lord God, amongst the dead, amongst that thing that is not moving and not living, Lord God. That marriages will be healed as they scatter, as they pour. Anxiety and depression will be gone. The healings will begin to take place. Heart issues, liver issues, kidney, blood issues. In the name of Jesus, lung issues. As they begin to pour, it will be evident that the power of the living God is having his way. Lord, let us no longer be complacent but to stand in your presence. Lord, we're not looking for an emotion or a feeling, Lord God. We've had emotions and feeling all our lives, Heavenly Father. I'm looking for a manifested change that when we leave this place, we will not be the same, Lord God. That we are making a decision to pour out. The Spirit of the living God is already evident, but you're the one that has to pour. You're the one that has to speak. You're the one that has to move. Don't prioritize those other things. Place Christ out front of everything. Lord Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for a fresh impartation of your spirit, Lord God. A fresh impartation of your spirit upon these vessels, Lord God. I have spoken my word. You are my vessels. I have chosen you. You have not chosen me. Speak and move and I have already gone before you. For I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. Lord, bless your people, Lord God. That we will no longer be the same. That we will understand the power of prayer, Lord God. The power of fasting. The power of praise unto you, Lord God. In placing you first. I pray for these vessels, Father, and I pray for their bloodline. I pray for their family members, their loved ones. I pray for their entire bloodline, Father. Those family members that have been rejecting you, that have been deliberately staying away from you, Lord God. Whatever it takes, bring them back, Lord God. Bring back the backslider, Lord God. Bring them back, Lord God. That we as a body will move at once, as one. Not separate, but as one, Father. 
For we have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. We come filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. We come to speak deliberately of the Word of God. Thank you, Lord God. Have your way, Father. Have your way, Jesus. We worship you, Lord God. We praise you, Father. I pray for healing in marriages, Lord. Restoration, Father, of souls, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Teach us how to pour, Lord God. Teach us how to scatter, Lord Father. That we will only offer life with our tongue and never death, Lord God. Where we have been okay and being complacent or indifferent in times past, no longer, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Coming to the historic Wilson Theater Saturday night, April 23rd, Little Willie G, the original voice of The Midnighters. The town I live in. Don't miss this powerful concert with the godfather of brown eyed soul. Little Willie G, the original voice of The Midnighters, accompanied by his 12 piece band, live at the historic Wilson Theater Saturday, April 23rd, 7 p.m. Tickets available at cornerstonefresno.com. <laughs>